This is the ancient... Uh, no, 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 no. This is the European history uh, lecture for Wednesday, the 16th of February, 2021. Where we last, last left things off. Um, Bismarck had orchestrated two, not one, two wars of unification designed to bring Germans uh, from the various states that they were in into a uh, more unified state. The war against Denmark saw both Austria and Prussia, with Prussia in the lead, <clears throat> come together in order to fight the Danes, and take the provinces of Schleswig and Holstein away from Denmark, which happens. <coughs> that was 1864. In 1866, Bismarck orchestrates a war with Austria. And in that war, Prussia's army marches into Austria-Hungary, and at Zadawa, crushes the Austrian army. Prussia has won the war, definitively won the war. And Helmut von Malta, the head of the uh, Prussian general staff, wants to goose step his way through Vienna in a victory parade. The army also wants territory. Bismarck says no. Absolutely not. We'll take Holstein because that's part of the pretext for the war. But we're not going to humiliate the Austrians. We're not going to do this because, shh, at some point soon, we're probably going to need them. And if we need the Austrians, then after humiliating them needlessly now in an act of complete self-satisfaction and unwisdom, they're not going to remain neutral. They're not going to do anything that will help us. In fact, they will happily stab their dagger in our back. So, we're not going to do that. And on this occasion, Bismarck is able to convince the old king, Wilhelm I of Prussia, to go along with his policy. The army's not happy. But Bismarck has achieved victory over Austria, and the benefit of that is that the Austrians are now out of German politics. This is really what Bismarck wanted. He could care less about Holstein. Bismarck wanted a Kleine Deutschland unification without the Habsburgs, without their non-Germans, without their Catholicism. A Germany where Prussia would be dominant. His Prussia. His Prussian king, his Prussian army will be the tool. And after the war with Austria, a defense alliance called the North German Confederation is set up throughout northern Germany. The lesser German states, as well as Prussia, come together, saying that an attack on one is an attack on all. Notably, Bavaria and Baden, the southern kingdoms, do not join. That's fine. So, for Bismarck's plan to come to fruition, he is going to need to arrange for a war where somebody up here, Prussia, is going to get attacked. Hmm. Well, European politics being what European politics are, it's just a matter of time, especially at this point in history. Spain. Spain's royal family dies off. And the Spaniards are shopping around for a new royal family. This is the way it works. The royal families of Europe help each other out. And when a royal family dies, another royal family comes in. And the Spanish government offers the throne of Spain to a cousin of King Wilhelm I, a Hohenzollern, a Prussian. Now, Prussia's not upset about this. Bismarck could care less, except he knows. 
He knows that there's going to be someone who really objects to this. Now, besides Portugal and Andorra, what nation borders Spain? France. Yes? France. And at this time, what nation borders the Prussian Rhineland besides Luxembourg and Belgium and Holland and the lesser German states? Yes? France! France in Alsace-Lorraine. Oh, the French have not gotten over the fact that it's no longer Napoleon's time. The German states have increased their population at a much higher rate to the French, and population means industrial power and it means manpower for the military. France has remained semi-industrialized, a sort of sleepy industrial backwater where they make good wine and cheese, if you like that sort of thing. On the other hand, Prussia and Germany has the Ruhr and other industrialized regions. France has not come to terms with the reality that they're not the center of the world anymore, if they ever were. But on top of all of that, it doesn't take a genius to comprehend that with Hohenzollerns ruling Prussia to their northwest, I'm sorry, to their northeast, and a Hohenzollern ruling Spain to the south, France is caught in a pincers movement between Prussia and Spain if there's a war. Plus, they don't like being, they, they don't like, they just don't like the idea. So the French press and government Scream, sacre bleu, bloody murder. That's not what sacre bleu means. Sacre bleu, for those of you who are francophones, I think means holy blue, which in French, no doubt, has a cultural significance that escapes me. So the French government, led by Napoleon III, he of the long waxed mustaches, the emperor of France, has a problem because the French people whipped up by their press are not going to be happy and they're not going to put up with a Hohenzollern ruler of Spain. So, Napoleon III makes a formal objection. Now, that objection travels to König Wilhelm I. König Wilhelm, King Wilhelm, is at a spa at Ems in the Rhineland. And Ems has the mineral water. Now, you early 21st century people may not appreciate what eight, not late 19th century people thought of spas. Spas are places that have hot springs with sulfur-rich mineral water. This is water that both boils and has an odor. And what people thought was that they would go to a spa and completely flush their system by eating and drinking and drinking and eating foods designed to completely flush out your bowels and everything else that's in you and replace all the water in your body with this healthy mineral water. This was a rage here in this country as well. In fact, Kellogg, of the cereal company fame, starts out business as a guy who owns a spa in upstate New York. So, if you're rich at this time, every so often, you take the waters at a spa. So... Old King Wilhelm, who, remember, is old, is at the spa taking the waters when the French government's objection comes to him in the hands of Bismarck.
the old king is not unreasonable. He could really care less about this. It's a distraction. So the old king basically scripts a reply that's very mild and moderate and says, you know what, fine. We'll withdraw our candidate. It's okay. We understand. Bismarck is the one who's going to send this telegram. And Bismarck decides that it is way too moderate. So Bismarck trick tweaks the wording. He adds a line saying, uh, oh, to the, uh, he adds a line saying that this will be the last time this happens. He also adds a line to the French release of the telegram, and it was a secret telegram, saying, don't ever do this again. So it, the French are made to say, please withdraw your candidate, and don't ever propose another one. And that second part of the statement is what Bismarck wrote, and it's obnoxious. And Wilhelm's reply is amped up in the obnoxious department. And then Bismarck releases the Ems telegrams to the media, to the press. The media in Prussia is furious at the tone of the French message. The media in France is furious at the tone of the German message. And Bismarck has his war, because France declares war on Prussia. <laughs> ah, Berlin! To Berlin, the French cry in the streets of Paris. So Napoleon leaves Paris and joins his army at Metz and begins organizing the invasion of the German territories here. But because it is an attack by a foreign power, because France is provoked into declaring war by Bismarck, the North German Confederation immediately forms its armies under Prussian command. And the Prussian general staff has prepared for this. They're ready. Now something amazing happens. Bismarck's diplomacy is so good that King Ludwig the Mad of the House of Wittelsbach of Bavaria, whose capital city is Munich, and the kings of Baden and Württemberg and southern Germany join in. So it's not just the North Germans that are fighting the French. It's all of the Germans, except the Austrians, who are going to remain neutral. Why? Because Bismarck didn't humiliate them. Because the Prussian army didn't goose step its way down Vienna's main streets. Because Prussia didn't take Austrian territory. So, Bismarck was right. By being generous to the Austrians, Bismarck keeps the Austrians neutral at a time when all of Germany's efforts, Germany's efforts are going to be devoted to fighting the French. Now, in this Franco-Prussian War, the Prussians are outgunned in two ways. The Prussians, as I told you, have the Dreyse needle gun, which is the prototype of all bolt-action rifles. The French developed their own bolt-action rifle called the Chassepa, which is a heavier weapon with longer range and straighter shots. So the personal firearm of the French soldier is superior to that of the Prussian and the other Germans. Also, the French developed something like a cross between a Gatling gun and a mortar called a Milteruse. And what the Milteruse is, picture a, a, a big cylinder about, uh, about a foot in diameter, sometimes more, on a tripod. So you place the tripod, you load the Milteruse, and it's got dozens and dozens and dozens of barrels. Now, a Gatling gun is an American-style machine gun that has a series of battle barrels that rotate. And as the barrels rotate, they are reloaded, fire, the, the cartridge comes out, new, new things come in. This was developed for the American Civil War. Modern fighter planes use a version of this called a Vulcan cannon, which is an automatic Gatling gun that shoots, shoots 20 millimeter cannon shells at ridiculous speeds. I'm talking thousands of shots per minute. So the idea of a cyclical round uh, gun is, is not a new one. But the French don't do it cycling. 
all of the barrels, the dozens and dozens of barrels in the Mitsuru's fire at once, or they can be fired row by row by row. So if troops approach the Mitsuru's, it fires like a giant super shotgun firing rifle bullets. It is very effective. Did you ever have it? Yes. Um, She's gonna sneeze. Gonna sneeze. Gonna sneeze. Gonna. She's gonna sneeze. Gonna sneeze. Gonna sneeze. There are tissues over there, over there that you can use right now, right now. Sorry, I thought life would become more interesting if it was a musical. <laughs> Go on. Can you please show us an image of said? At the end of class, I'm going to be showing videos and images. So remind me, and I'll show the mitzvahs. Okay. But despite, she hasn't sneezed yet. Well, I'm all disappointed. Though. Okay. Your fault. Don't be a sneeze tease. <laughs> <laughs> yes. The gal weight. The gal weight. The gal weight. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay, a gal cannon is a super Vulcan gun. I know that. It's, uh, it's, it's the 30 millimeter version of a Vulcan that they put on the A10. Yeah, which, which shoots depleted uranium rounds. Nice yeah, no, a, a, a depleted uranium round, by the way, will go through almost any tank armor like a hot knife through butter. <laughs> yeah, uh, I love the A-10. It's really weird during that thing fire, because you see it fire, you hear it hit, and yeah. then you hear it fire. It's yeah. Like, it's oh, no, it's, it's an amazing weapon system, and the Air Force keeps trying to shut it down oh, because no. it's ground support rather than air-to-air. -air. Uh, now, the A-10 is and was our answer to Russian tanks and uh, would be the Chinese tanks if there were a Third World War, yes. You should play the next Zac Efron in the high school music. Oh, I can't Gloria sing. Beautiful. I have a decent yeah, voice, did. but I've never learned to hold a tune. You just didn't the last know. time I sang, public, sang publicly, I sang, I think, the national anthem at the 20th anniversary of 9-11. And I had several people come up to me afterwards, students and teachers, and say, you know, that would have been great if you actually held your tune. I don't know how. I've never learned. At some point, I may join the men's chorus just to learn. Let's go. Yes, but yes, so I don't have time you. yet. Not yet. Come on. You have to. Okay. What is he talking about? <clears throat> what a vainglorious... Uh, never mind. I, I'm not going to. I'm not going to. Thank you. Thank you for your thought. So... Uh, Anything to distract them. Despite the fact that the French have these weapons superiority, what the Prussians have is their general staff. So while the French army is organizing, which is actually going to take months, except for an attack near Malouge down here, uh, and an attack up a battle, the French army is still largely organizing. The Prussian army is using railroads as well as troops to mass huge numbers of troops, and with Bavaria and Baden involved, uh, the Rhine is crossed and the French uh, frontier is pierced in several places. What the army then does, the Prussian, the German army now, under, under the Prussian general staff, is they surround and isolate Metz, where the Emperor Napoleon III is, and where the French headquarters is, and where the French Imperial Army is. So, they lay siege to Metz, and Napoleon III surrenders. But the war is not over, because the city of Paris repudiates Napoleon's government and sets up a variant of a new republic for the country. But the city of Paris is taken over by an organization called the Paris Commune. These communards are French communists. And so France and the city of Paris don't surrender. They defy the Germans. So the Germans march on Paris and surround it. The French government controls the countryside, sort of a republic, and the uh, communards control the city of Paris. This is the rest of 1870. In 1871, siege guns are brought in that begin to flatten Paris, sections of it. 
Baron Hausman's beautiful recreation is threatened. The Comunards fight, but before the war is over, Bismarck's plan is going to be realized in an act of real hubris. In the Hall of Mirrors at Versailles, the ultimate French palace, a meeting is held among all monarchs uh, of Germany, north and south. Bismarck has been organizing this behind the scenes. The war is going so well. And what a colossus Germany would be if unified. That they propose to King William that he become emperor, no, no, German emperor. Now, German is a very precise language. Germans have different titles for a colonel of parachute troops as opposed to a colonel of engineers or a colonel of artillery or a colonel of infantry or a colonel of cavalry. And you use this specific rank all the time. What the Holy Roman Emperors were, were emperors of Germany. And they therefore had authority throughout Germany. But there are concerns. And what Bismarck's able to get is German Emperor. German Emperor makes the King of Prussia the highest ranking nobleman in all of Germany. But being the highest ranking nobleman doesn't in itself confer the kind of imperium that being Emperor of Germany would. And this distinction matters. But politics is the art of the possible, and Bismarck gets German Emperor and even King Ludwig the Mad of Bavaria agrees. Now, if you get a chance to look at this painting, you can see Ludwig the Mad. He's sort of a weird bearded figure behind Bismarck. Um, they don't call him Ludwig the Mad for no reason. Ludwig the Mad's greatest claim to fame, aside from agreeing to this, is that he is a devotee of Wagner's operas. He loves romantic music and romantic literature, and he's got a money, the money of a major German kingdom. So the government of Bavaria, and later Germany, encourage him to build a Wagnerian ideal, a castle out of fairy tales. Not a practical medieval fortification, but a fairyland castle, which will be the basis of Walt Disney's castles. This castle is called Neuschwanstein. Neuschwanstein, the new swan castle. And Neuschwanstein is used in a variety of movies. It's this beautiful white castle in the middle of the forested uh, Bavarian Alps. You're going to sneeze again, aren't you? <laughs> and, um... Sneeze! Um, okay. Sometimes. It works with hiccups. Um, so Neuschwanstein is used in a number of movies. I may show you pictures later. I probably will. And it is this beautiful fairyland castle. Completely impossible. Big windows, tall towers, thin little spires. But it looks beautiful. And that's what King Ludwig the Man, the Man of Bavaria does with his life. And it is still a legacy. It's, it's a major tourist uh, attraction in, in, in Bavaria. And if you ever get a chance to go to Munich and Bavaria, in addition to going there and drinking the beer, which you should do when you're old enough, although Germans drinking age is, is, is lower than here, for beer anyway. Um, yeah. See uh, Neuschwanstein, it's beautiful. I've never seen it personally, of course, but I've seen it in cameras, pictures, and things, and in movies. Okay. So this is all brought to King Wilhelm. This is what Bismarck's been going for. And King Wilhelm says, no. What? No! I was made King of Prussia by God! You want me to become Emperor? I'm sorry, German Emperor? because of a bunch of other kings and politicians? You want me to proverbially, and this is echoing Friedrich Wilhelm, take a crown from the gutter? I don't want to. I'm happy just being king of Prussia. 
Bismarck takes a crystalline ashtray and smashes it into a fireplace. Then actually just resign! You don't care about Germany, I guess, your majesty? You don't care about all the fighting and all the work? I, you, you obviously just don't want me anymore. And by this point, point, Bismarck has the old king so wrapped around his finger that in tears, the old king finally agrees. This happened. It wasn't the only time that Bismarck threw furniture. <laughs> by the way, for what it's worth, when Bill Clinton was president, there, were, there was one or two occasions where he came out sporting a shiner. That's a black eye. The president of the United States had a black eye that they tried covering with makeup. Now, how does anyone get close enough to the president of the United States with the Secret Service around to give him a black eye? Hmm, who could have done that? Hillary. Uh, there's no question it was Hillary. Uh, she, she, she was known for throwing things and having temper tantrums herself back when she was first lady. This is, of course, 30 years ago. 40. So, Wilhelm agrees, and that painting is one of the most famous paintings of the late 19th century, and it shows the proclamation of the German Empire at the Hall of Mirrors in Versailles, southwest of Paris. Uh, Bismarck is the key figure on the right, wearing a white uniform with thigh-high boots. Helmut von Moltke, the head of the Ger Ger uh, German now general staff, is at the lower right to the right of Bismarck. And standing at the top with the big white whiskers is King Wilhelm, and his son is behind and to the right, and all the kings of Germany are there. So... This area is now all the German Empire, with the capital city, not in Frankfurt, like it used to be, but in Berlin. And the house of Hohenzollern, the rulers of Prussia, will dominate, will be the emperors. And the Prussian army will basically dominate the other armies. And the Prussian system will dominate the other system. Germany is set up as a federal empire, which means that the states like Bavaria and Baden do have strong authority within themselves, Oldenburg and Mecklenburg, but that as an empire, the Prussians will dominate. And the Prussians mean the army. After that, the Paris Commune is utterly destroyed, and France surrenders, and... The army demands, we didn't take any territory from Austria. We're going to march through the ruins of Paris. But we want, on the west bank of the Rhine, south of the Rhineland, the provinces of Alsace and Lorraine. Well, Alsace and much, most of Lorraine. Because the Vosges Mountains are here. And the general staff wants to have the Vosges Mountains as a uh, barrier against future French attack and as a jumping off point if we have to fight the French again. Now, Alsace-Lorraine had been part of the German cultural area until the time of King Louis XIV in the late 1600s, early 1700s. So it wasn't that long ago that this area was German, not by historical terms, 150 years. But during that time, the French Revolution happened, Napoleon happened, and the entire French nation was wrapped up in that experience. One of the things that separates the French of Quebec from the French of France, or anywhere else pretty much in the world, even Haiti, is that Quebec was under British rule and therefore didn't experience the French Revolution. So there's a major disconnect between Quebecois French uh, descendants and French people almost everywhere else. Alsace-Lorraine had gone through the French Revolution, and while there were plenty of Germans here who were happy about it becoming part of Germany, there are plenty of French here who are not. Also, the French are going to be made to pay what's called an indemnity. Now, the word indemnity The word indemnity means uh, what you pay when you lose a war. Loser pays. It's like losing a poker game. 
Now, not all wars have indemnities, but the Prussian army, the German army now, wants Alsace and Lorraine, and they want France to pay for the war. But they don't, they don't just want France to pay for the war. They also want to have France pay. <clears throat> so that like a vampire, the indemnity will suck France's economic energy for years to come. They want the indemnity to penalize France so that the French will not again become a threat to Germany. Bismarck argues against all of this. And he tries yelling and he tries throwing things and it doesn't matter. He won all those other battles. He got the unified Germany he wanted under his king, which means under him. But uh, he does not win this battle. France ends up paying a huge amount of money. Oh, and they pay it off early. The French are so angry that the economy comes together. This is something rare in France. French people of all types come together to pay this off. So they can start rebuilding their military because they're they're upset because they lost Alsace Lorraine. They say that their country has been amputated. They want, and the entire French nation, almost except for the communists, embed themselves in a culture of revanche, revanche, and revanche means revenge. French politicians for two generations use revenge and the desire to reclaim Alsace-Lorraine and pay Germany back for the humiliation of 1871. France is going to become a permanent enemy of the new Germany. And Bismarck's diplomacy for the rest of his life, and it's a long one, is going to be spent keeping France isolated from all other alliances. Because the French are not going to forgive the Germans. The French are not going to accept the peace. The French think that they were abused, and they want revanche, and they want Alsace-Lorraine back. And so Bismarck was right. Again, the army was wrong, but the army won the argument. Because, because the army won the argument, France is made into a perpetual enemy. Now, is it possible that had Bismarck been able to make a generous peace with the French, not take Alsace-Lorraine, not assign an indemnity, not rub the French's noses into their defeat? Is it possible that France might have not been a friend of Germany, but at least been you know, willing to move on with their lives? Maybe. We'll never know, because Bismarck lost that argument. So, Germany is now unified. The unification of Germany in 1871 Please close the shade, shut the fan, and uh, turn the lights off. There are a few visuals. Okay. Let's see. Okay. First, we'll start with a... Uh, in the 1970s, they made uh, the British made a TV miniseries called Fall of Eagles. And it's about the politics from the mid-1800s in the year 1848, actually, all the way through the end of World War I. And it tells the story of the fall of the Habsburgs, the Hohenzollerns, and the Romanovs in Austria, Hungary, Germany, and Russia. That's, I think, a really good series. And they have a couple of episodes devoted to Bismarck. Oh, that's not the one I want. Not the one I want. Okay. Um, Bismarck's the guy with... You'll, you'll, you'll know him. He's dominates the scene. This is just after the Franco-Prussian War. Or it's, it's, it's as they're negotiating the German Empire. We must occupy Vienna. No, Your Majesty. The army must march through it. And precipitate the general conflict? Why not? Ah, okay, I was wrong. But you still, you're going to get to see this. This is, a, this is the argument over whether or not to take Austrian territory. I'll start it over a little bit again.
Uh, and Bismarck is arguing with the clean-shaven von Moltke, the head of the Prussian general staff, and the old king. Well, you'll see the old king. We must occupy Vienna. No, Your Majesty. The army must march through it. And precipitate the general conflict? Why not? The commanders are prepared. Many are fools. We will not make Russia stronger by taking one yard of Austrian land. The Austrians have lost. And we won our prize. Now let's go home and bargain. I will not agree. Am I Your Majesty's Minister President or not? Let each tribe stay in its own lands. What would be gained by subduing Austria? Power. Power in Hungary and in the Balkans. Hunger is full of Catholic Magyars. Let them keep it. But the Balkans aren't worse. The healthy bones of one single Pomeranian grenadier. Let the others fight their own battles. War should only be used for a policy worth and sacrifices. Only oh, one who has seen men dying on the battlefield. I have a likely fight. Oh, don't cry, man. His tears are political. You imagine I won't agree? I can no longer serve you. I began this war. I can't end it. I may as well be dead. Come back, Miss Mark. Come here, for God's sake, man! Come down and be reasonable! But your majesty, relentless to me! Listen to me, father. I began this war for a political purpose. Now it's achieved, and everything else is nonsense. We have shown Europe our strength now. We must use it wisely. We shall at least need the neutrality of Austria if ever we have to fight Russia or France. I agree with Count von Bismarck. You agree in this case? I'm flattered. We will return to Berlin and negotiate with strength. Enough blood has been shed. His Royal Highness, the Crown Prince, speaks with good sense and humanity. You're all against me. This is disgusting. Let us go home to our families. Melodramatic, but accurate. He threw a crystal uh, ashtray at when he was arguing. Save, <laughs> when he was arguing about uh, France. Yes. Okay, wait. Why was the king upset about that decision? Well, the king thought you win a war, you march through the enemy capital, you take some territory. Oh. The army was appealing to his sense of tradition, and Bismarck didn't want to do that. But the king is also a very weak individual in the sense of he relies on Bismarck, and now Bismarck seems to be against him. Um, and it's, it's, it's emotional, and it's little old man stuff, and Bismarck played on all of that to rule. Yeah. Should we talk about Joseph Trudeau? No, not yet. Wait for it if we have time. And I don't know if we will. Now, um, there is another brief video that goes into some of the superficial differences between the German Empire that Bismarck creates and Nazi Germany and uh, the Germany after unification in 1991.
So again, it's simple and superficial, but it may give you some perspective. So I'm playing. This is Kaiser Wilhelm II, who ends up taking over after Bismarck, obviously, the Austrian Corporal Adolf, and Angela Merkel, who, for whatever reason, the Germans kept electing as Chancellor throughout most of the last 20 years. <laughs> showed that uh, Wilhelm died only three years before Hitler, so where was he when Hitler was... He, uh, at the end of World War One, abdicated the throne and retreated to Holland, which was a neutral country. Oh. The Dutch granted him asylum, <clears throat> and he lived there in retirement. Now, when Germany conquered Holland, the Nazis tried playing games with Wilhelm, trying to convince him that if he came back, they'd make him emperor again. Hitler had no intention of that. But the Kaiser wisely stayed away. Um, we'll talk more about that. But yeah, he died in 1941, I think. Let's go images. Still large to go home. Yeah. Getting an idea just looking at all of these. Um, I think I like this one the best. So, he is wearing a piccolo, a fancy piccolo helmet, which is the spiked helmet of the Prussian army. Um, he has this giant walrus-like mustache. And he has, as time goes on, a bigger and bigger and bigger belly. Um, now, there is a famous uh, 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 sketch of him with uh, Napoleon III, after the Battle of Sedan, 
and the surrender, not the second, uh, and the and the surrender uh, thereof. Here we go. Make sure it's large. Yeah. See it. So, uh, here is defeat in the form of Napoleon III and victory in the form of Bismarck of Prussia. Now, you had said you wanted to see the militarus. See if I can spell it correctly. Try that. Sam? Is it in your notes somewhere? Okay. Franco Russian or French. Hopefully that'll give us something. Okay, here we go. Mint rail. Use with two L's because it's French. Okay, so here is a good picture of one photograph. And what you see here is the entire back opened up, swung open, you could load a bunch of bullets, and it could fire again in, in, in rows or totally. But imagine having the entire thing discharged in your general direction. Each of these is a full-scale rifle bullet. Pistol bullets might kill a man, might wound him. Uh, rifle bullets usually will kill a man, and if not, will certainly wound him and maybe knock him down. Okay, what else? Uh, what? I can't. Oh, ah, yes, thank you. No way. Schwan. Okay. So you're getting a sense. Ah, this one is good. One. Look for big. Okay. There is a movie from the 70s, a children's movie that your family may have forced on you called Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. Yeah. In Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, there that this castle is is shown as the, the home of the villainous fellow. I forget who he was. He was basically a caricature of Otto von Bismarck. So here's the fairy tale castle. And if you've ever seen any of the Disney castles, you can see that Walt Disney basically copied uh, this. Well, let's see if I can get that scene from Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. Will Sam Hunt live in Norman Quest? Shut it! Oh, what? You can see it on your way out if you want. Oh, no, 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 no,